me. The college's conferences is now in session. I'd like to give a little bit about the breakdown of the college, what our basic rules are, and uh, what we do. The College of Conflicts consists of the following. First, we have a brief announcements period. Second, we have a, the speaker will speak for up to an hour or however he long he needs to take care of his speech. Then we'll have a questions period where we ask that you ask a question, and then we will have our infamous rebuttal period. Normally everybody has up until about three to four minutes to uh, speak on or off the topic. We just ask that you be coached and coherent during that rebuttal period, and not just waste a waste of time with a bunch of stuff. They don't know. I would like to introduce now our main speaker, the history and current situation of the ground in Palestine, Israel, and he's going to do it through poetry, prose, and art. Through poetry, prose, and art, semi-retired librarian Daniel Stop Weinberg will analyze the background and recent developments of the Middle East. Penning drawings of the political and comic drawings by Weinberg can be purchased online. We'll probably get more to that. Uh, if you're ready, let's give you a big hand and uh, get you started here. All right. My name is Dan Weinberg. This is a picture of me uh, at the Northside Peace Gathering. I'm in the middle there with the hat. And I hold the sign that says U.S. out of Middle East because the U.S. should get out of the Middle East. They should. Now, now, to get peace in the Middle East, or specifically Israel, um, <clears throat> Israel should give rights to the Palestinians to vote, number one. Israel should tear down the solid uh, separation wall and definitely should take down all the checkpoints and integrate Palestinians into the society. Anyways, that is my plan, peace plan. I know the United States has been trying to promote peace for the last 60 years, almost all my, well, more than my lifetime, and um, it hasn't worked. So I think actually the United States is, has an interest in keeping the Palestinians and the Jews or the Israelis separate, and I think the reason is because they, the United States thinks, the government thinks, that if the Palestinians and the Jews come together as a country, eventually there will be an Arab president, and this new country would go over to the Arabs, and Israel would become like Syria or Jordan. And th this is the fear of the American government, I think. And um, it might be a real fear. I don't know. But I think that in order to uh, promote peace, there should be a confederation of the Jews and Arabs in this new land, which might be called Palestine or Israel or something else. Next. So this is a picture of, picture of uh, Gaza in 2014, I think it was called Operation Cast Lead. Uh, it was a very destructive time in Gaza. Gaza has no anti-aircraft guns. They have no um, army. And so Israel just brought their bombers in and just bombed uh, the streets and the houses. I saw a number somewhere. 18,000 um, Palestinian houses were killed, were destroyed, and something like one Israeli house was destroyed. Um, 
I was in Israel in 1999. I stayed there. I stayed in Jerusalem for about 10 days. I was going to a yeshiva, actually, or Sameach. And uh, I wasn't active. To, I wasn't active politically right then. And um, I kind of feel stupid about that. But I might be going back to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza at a later time, maybe next year or the year after that, 2020. Um, as you can see in the picture, there's quite a lot of destruction. And um, I think it's terrible. So this is a picture from last week, actually, in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Um, it was a Jewish Voice for Peace demonstration uh, in downtown Evanston. And it says something like, Palestinians should be free. And uh, we stand on the corner. Actually, um, some senators and congressmen have, have said something about that. Uh, Schakowsky, Jan Schakowsky said yeah. something recently, I think. And uh, Bernie Sanders, I think, said something. Uh, Elizabeth Warren said something about the killing in Gaza and how terrible it is and how overreacting Israel is. This is some of my our joy, Jewish Voice for Peace is saying. And in the corner it says BDS. Now BDS, some people think it's anti-Semitic. Some people think it's uh, self-hating Jews doing this. I don't think it is. I, I, I love Israel. I have cousins who lived in Israel, who used to live in Israel. And they go back there a lot to see their friends. And I get along with them fine. Um, it's the government of Israel that I disagree with. I mean, BDS was similar to uh, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and it worked. And it worked. It took, except the only thing is, it took 30 years. I mean, anti-apartheid started in 1960s, early 62, maybe. And there were movements then, and it took 30 years. So this current BDS started in 2005, I think. So it's been uh, 13 years. So it, it's going slow, slowly. And so it might take another 17 years, which is 2045, 35, 2035. So maybe until 2035, it would take to force uh, the government of Israel to change. Of course, you'd have to change the government of America, or the mindset of the government of America at the same time, since uh, Israel is almost like a state of the United States. But um, anyway, I have, a, I have a statement here by, uh, by uh, Lieutenant Britton Davis of the US Army. It's about the Indian, Indian Americans. We have heard much talk of the treachery of the Indian. In treachery, broken pledges on the part of high officials lies, thievery, slaughter of defenders, defenseless women and children, and every crime in the catalog of man's inhumanity to man. The Indian was a mere amateur compared to the noble white man. So, um, they, so, Russell Means, who's a famous Indian leader who died recently, uh, he said that American Indians are the Palestinians of America, and uh, Palestinians are the American Indians of Israel. No, of Israel. So I mean, it, the same thing are ha we're happening to both indigenous peoples, and usually it happens to all indigenous peoples. They're pushed off the land, they're killed, they're murdered, they're seen as treacherous, and seen as lying, and seen as ignoble, not noble. And we have to we have to teach them. We're Christians. We're, we're believers in Christ, and so we have to make them better than they are. So they are killed and murdered. What well, quite well? Um, the, there was a, a law in America called the Indian Removal Act in 1830, um, 
Andrew Jackson, who was president, who was a great Indian fighter. And that moved the Seminoles and the Creeks from Alabama, Mississippi, over the Mississippi to what was then Oklahoma Territory. And so, I mean, America is similar to Israel, what they're doing to the Palestinians. They did it to the Native Americans, Indian, Indian Americans. Um, let's do a poem. Erica Violet Lee, poem. We both live in occupied territories, but what can I know about you? Half a world away from me. You and me, no violence. The pain of our mothers, the memories of this land. We share a history of being moved, removed, moved again, taken from our homes and wondering if we'll ever go back. You and me, we're the nation. And this is for the mothers and daughters leading movements from Gaza to the grasslands. You and me, we're the resistance. This is for the women who never left their houses until the day they were carried out. Tell me again about your revolution. This is for the women who are raped and told that speaking out will dishonor their community. And abortion is a crime, so it's best to suffer in silence. Tell me again about your damn revolution. You and me, we're the resistance. And this is for the women who are told not to speak, not to write or read, not to dream or feel, but do it anyway. You and me, we're the revolution. So, next picture. This is a picture of uh, Palestinian land that's been slowly taken away. You could say you could say the same thing about a map of America. So as you go from 1946 to 2010, you see the green becoming smaller and smaller. Not a lot of them. This is some art work by a Palestinian cartoonist, Mohammed Sabahan. It's called the State of Israel. So it has a picture of the capital, the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. And so it's like a stamp, a fake stamp. And it's, uh, so it has State of Israel, Medina, Israel in, in Hebrew, and I guess that's State of Israel in Arabic. And so um, he's saying that Israel is a state. Oh, I have Maybe a state of the United States, with, uh, which is uh, It's not such a bad deal. Right. <laughs> but, then, but then it's not a state of the United States. It's supposed to be an independent country. I have so many. Yeah, I know. Right. Better than so many. <laughs> this is a picture of Palestinians at a checkpoint. They're probably going to work or school or visiting people, maybe going to work in the morning. And so you can see how filled up it is. It's just uh, not, not very nice. Um, and so if they were made full citizens of the country, they could walk back and forth. And there's probably a wall, 30 foot high wall there that they have to go through. Um, and this is supposed to be about terrorism. Now, terrorism goes both ways, I think. There's a lot of violence in settler colonialism, which you might call what Israel is doing, settler colonialism, which is similar to what America did in the 1700s and 1800s. They settled uh, California. They took, in the war they, with Mexico, they took California, Arizona, New Mexico, etc., etc., and they settled it. They colonialized. Um, it wasn't easy, it was very violent, and that's not nice, so I'm against that. Um, so America and Israel are very similar in the way they settled the country. This is a piece of art by a Palestinian artist, whatsoever ye saw it. <coughs> so it's a saw cut into pieces. Something like Palestine cut into pieces, and smaller and smaller pieces, and it's, uh, he's actually, Rajay Cook is a very well-known uh, artist, uh, commercial artist. If you Google his name, I'm sure you'll find a lot of information about him.
All right, this is a group called the Tura Karta. They're Orthodox Jews who are, some people think they're crazy, but they're, um, they're very small group. But actually, some live in New York, some live in London, and some live in Jerusalem. So, and what they say is Jews worldwide condemn unending Israeli brutality. And they also say Judaism rejects Zionism and the right of and the state of Israel. Well, because they say that Israel is an illegal state until the Messiah comes and the Jews don't believe in Christ. So they don't believe, Jews don't believe that the Messiah has come. So they, these people, the Turakarta, are saying that um, that the state of Israel is illegal. So they are saying, yeah. And they, they, are actually, they were actually advisors to uh, Yasser Arafat, and they have shook, shaken hands with Ahmadinejad of uh, in Iran. And uh, very unique group, that like. <laughs> Okay, this is Ariel Sharon's statement in 2003 before he uh, was in a coma. And he says, it, it is not possible to continue holding three and a half million people under occupation. Sharon told an assembly of enraged lawmakers from his Likud party. You may not like the word, but what's happening is occupation. This is a terrible thing for Israel, for the Palestinians, and for the Israeli economy. So he's saying that, that the occupation is not a good thing. And um, he was a very honored general. He had a very long career as a general. Then he became prime minister. Then he was not prime minister. I think in 2003 he was not prime minister, but he was in the, in the government. So he changed his mind. And now when people in Israel talk about Sharon, they say he's uh, he was corrupt. He, he did have a. Uh, there was a case against him and his son, but uh, I think this is one major thing that uh, he he has. Oh, time for a poem. Okay, this is Suad Amiri, an obsession. Would you ever let go of me for a lifetime, for a year, a month, an hour, a minute, even a second? No. If ever, if ever we get an apology, if ever we get compensation for our losses, it would not be about a lost country. It would not be about a lost field or an orange grove or a lost home. No, it would not be about the hundreds of bulldozed villages or the shattering of a whole society. It would not be about losing a livelihood, a stolen piano, a Persian carpet, or a first baby picture album. And it would not be about someone's personal library a left behind Arab horse, or a Cypriot donkey, or a Persian cat, nor even Shar Shasa, Shasa the monkey that my mother gave me a few days before the war. No, and it would not be about the blooming almond tree and the red flowering pomegranates that were not, too, not tenderly picked in the spring of 1948, nor in the summer after. And it would not be about firing on the farmers who returned the harvest to harvest the fields they left behind. Nor would it be about the many deserted building, building okay. budding roses, or the bride's wardrobe, and her many cherished presents, or a child or an old woman who was forgotten, left behind in the midst of havoc. No, it would not be about concealing a crime or falsifying history. It would not be about blaming the victim. It would not be about dehumanizing and stereotyping. It would not be about making new wandering Jews out of us. It would not be about reversing roles and images, no, if at all. It will only be about an obsession. So some people are obsessed with this, with this subject. Um, of course, there are like a million or many hundreds of thousands of refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, in the, in the uh, Gaza Strip that are still in refugee camps after 50 years. So, and uh, as you know, the UN has, 
is uh, getting less money from America because of President Trump. And uh, we'll see what happens. I think part of the reason that these, these demonstrations in Gaza are becoming so big is part, that's part of the reason, the reaction. These people don't know what's going to happen in the future. So this is uh, another piece of art by Burhan Karkoukli. Yes to Palestine. It's a, a fighter with a fist raised. This is about 1983, I think. 82, it says on your 82. This is more art, ninth wave of the Kafar Qasim massacre. What's that? It's people huddling together <coughs> after the massacre of the uh, Israelis. In 1947-48, part of the ethnic cleansing program of the Israeli armies was to empty Israel for the Jews, basically. For Zionists. Now, uh, this was supposed to be an empty country for a, a, a empty country for a for people, a land without a, a land without a people for a people without a land. This is the this is the stereotypical answer. But the thing is that Zionism started in 18 modern Zionism started in 1890 with Herzl. And actually, Herzl was for a confederation with the Arabs. He was not so much of a, a Zionist that he ignored the Arabs. And actually, the first, the first Rashi, which is a comment on the Torah, the Bible, Old Testament, the first Rashi, which Rashi was a famous commentator on the Bible in about 1100 in France, in the first one, that he says is something about people in the land of Israel, people being there already. And even though God said, you know, the Jews can have the land from, from the Mediterranean to the Tigris and Euphrates River, well, even God didn't say that exactly. I don't know what God said. I wasn't there when he was speaking. But um, supposedly that's what he said. And so this gave. Uh, license to Zionists to murder and kill 400 little villages in Israel and and Palestine is is that what it said? Really? I don't, I'm not so sure. And also, uh, uh, <clears throat> to to give. Uh, License for people to go into a land and just take the people out is not right. These are some date palm tree. Very nice. This is a funny cartoon by Mohammed Sabana. Maybe in 2010, I'm not sure, but an uh, arms deal between England and the Saudi Arabians. And in the middle is human rights. Of course, the Saudi Arabians just bought $100 billion worth of arms from America, which is kind of a lot of money. And uh, Israel gets $3.8 billion every year. And $3 billion of that has to be built bought has to be spent on arms in America, like Boeing, uh, all those, Marietta, Martin Marietta, and et cetera, et cetera, Rockwell. And the other 800, 800 million is for the missile defense system. Now, this is very nice, but I mean, Saudi Arabia has got $100 billion, so Hundred billion versus three point eight. I don't know what's, what's the ratio. And so I don't know. I think America is going crazy, 
and just giving out money like like hot potatoes. This is another piece of art by Abu Chakra, 2008. The green line, the green line is a boundary, the official boundary before 67. So he just makes a green line down the middle and sort of makes it into a target. Those are little airplanes in the background, three little airplanes. And so it's just sort of a comedy, funny thing about making a green line, green line be a target practice. And if I go back to Israel, if I have a chance to go back, I, I will try to go to Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and see for myself what it looks like. I'm kind of interested in seeing what Gaza looks like to see if it, if it has been rebuilt at all from 2014 or 15, was it? Um, you know, there's a blockade on Gaza. Uh, there, there's a, um, they get, give you a menu here? they get something like four hours of electricity every day, and they never know when the four hours will be. They get like maybe six hours of water every two days. I mean, that's hard. They're used to, they're used to a good life. And if people in Chicago got that, I think people in Chicago would start throwing rocks at the army, or they would start. You know, cut the fence lines and start protesting, just like in Gaza. <laughs> so this is a Canadian demonstration this year, I think, or maybe 2017. So it looks a little bit bigger than America. There are demonstrations around the world that, like you saw the picture of a Evanston one. There are, more, there are more demonstrations in England and Europe than in America. Americans, for some reason, don't want to demonstrate about Israel. I don't know. Maybe they think it's the third rail. They think it's really trouble. They might get fired from their job. They might get ostracized by their friends. They might not talk to any friends anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You're nodding. And so, if, so they sort of keep the, their opinions to themselves. I think, which maybe I should have, but I didn't. So if I get a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls and a lot of threatening letters, I'll, I'll at least know where they're coming from and why, they, why I'm getting them because of my talk here. And it'll be on the internet. I'll let Tim put it on the internet. And if anybody, if people want to see it, they can see it. And if I get fired, if I get shot, if I get killed, or I get put in jail or deported to Russia, well, I'll see you there. I'll, I'll see the, the college on online. The problem is, Dan, I don't think many people will view it because uh, the most popular... The most popular video I have right now is the moon landing hoax. Yeah. Siberia? Yeah. Wait, one more. Let's see. Let's see what else is. Sign few more. All right, this is my heart. Ooh. Piece of Palestine, fresh meat. Actually, there's an updated version of it, but... Um, that's a nice, nice piece of art. Is it kosher? Yeah, it's kosher. And this is my uh, website, so I do want to get that. I know Charlie put it on the on the announcement, so some people have been clicking on it. That's nice, thank you. This is just for people who don't click. Go ahead. Not everybody clicks. All right. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn was Prime Minister for a while, until uh, Theresa May became Prime Minister. So he said, the killing and wounding of yet more unarmed Palestinian protesters yesterday by Israeli forces in Gaza is an outrage. Jeremy Corbyn said that this month. Really, it's a really bad source. Yeah. And this is a checkpoint in 2017. You can see the Israeli soldiers with their big machine guns. And actually, when I was there in 1999, the, see that big machine gun the guy in the front has? I think they all had those in uh, downtown Jerusalem. Just about every corner had a 
army person with a machine gun. And this was a quiet time. This was December of 99. There was no, there were no intifadas. Oh yeah, that reminds me. So, this is a book. This is a book called P is for Palestine. It's an ABC book for Palestine. It's by a Dr. Goldberg Bashi. It's a lady. Is that the unreal pornography? No, it's, it's the uh, armor. This is C is for Christmas, coziest in Jesus Christ's country with the crunchiest candy. What? It's a children. So this is H for Handala, Ben, here is Hellos, he is our hero. So it's a, it's a picture of a cartoon character on the separation wall. You can look at it yourself. When did they come out? Uh, 17, 2017. It's brand new. I got it on the internet. It was uh, very hard to get. It's a really, really nice book. One of the most recent infamous pieces of propaganda. Propaganda, but you know, everybody's got their own propaganda. Pablo Picasso says, the world today doesn't make sense, so why should I okay, paint pictures now. that do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And this is Picasso's uh, learning belt. So it shows the bombing and different pieces of people. It's, uh, actually, it was at the United Nations, I think. I'm not sure, maybe a copy. But it's old. Yeah, it's 1937. The Spanish Civil War. Right. So it was at the United, this picture was at the United Nations recently in 2003 when Colin Powell was being interviewed. And he was being interviewed in front of it. And supposedly they had to move him away from there. So it was too controversial to be in, interviewed in front of the Picasso. So art is power. <laughs> This is just some more art. A little kid throwing a rock and the world, basically. Okay, that's about it. Thank you. All right. All right. Hey, boy. Yeah. Thank you. Not bad, Dan. All right. All right, let's uh do you want to just tell me and point out questions? Okay. If you have questions, let's uh, get. Well, uh, hang on a minute here. Get this uh, thing off, and then we'll start going here. All right. Uh, Dan, you want to point them out and go? Uh, you're Jewish, right? Yeah, I'm Jewish. And you're Jewish. Why is it that you think that the Palestine people should? Be. That's a good question. I mean, you're I Jewish. You're why, Jewish. Why, why am I being for the Palestinians and I'm Jewish? It's a good question. I, I, thought, I think about it all the time. Um, it's, hard, it's a hard question to answer, actually. But I think it's the right thing to do. I think the world is a is a limited place. I think Jews and Arabs can live together. I think that break, that tearing down 18,000 homes of Palestinians just so a Jew can move into their house. Well, they tore it down so they can't move into it. But they moved it. Jews have moved into Palestinian houses all the time. Does that make it right? Does, can you say God? God said I could do it, so I'm going to kick these people out. You know, go on to Western Avenue, pick a house, pick any house. <laughs> Tell the people, get out. God, you know, knock on their door, get out. God said we could move here. Bye. You know, so they have five minutes to get out. Is that nice? 
No, that's not nice. So maybe I want to be a nice person. That's all. I want to get along with people. That's all. It's that simple. Just get along. Um, I understand okay, that a lot of the really uh, factories and and businesses that are owned by Israelis, a lot of it has been taken over by foreign corporations. Do you know anything about that? No, I know that some corporations have been going on the West Bank and maybe they change owners so that Israel can sell the stuff to America, to Europe. But I don't know what you're talking about exactly. How long do we have to wait? <laughs> yeah, a uh, couple things. Uh, you, you said you don't know why Americans won't or they said they may be a little scared to protest uh, Israel. In one case, there was a fellow who was the, uh, uh, for Dan Biss was his lieutenant governor, I don't remember his name, but he was supportive of BDS, and he got knocked off the table. Carlos Ramirez Rosa. Right, thank you. Could, you. could you comment on that? And then, do you know the rabbi, I've forgotten his name, that wrote the book, Wrestling in the Daylight? Yeah. And uh, yeah. what's his name? I forgot. Brant Rosen. Brant Rosen. Do you know him? Have you talked to him? Has he influenced you at all? Because he's also, obviously he's Jewish, he's a rabbi, and he's kind yeah. of... Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace and uh, Rabbi Rosen's group also. So, um, yes, I know Rabbi Rosen, yes. I've spoken to him, I've emailed him. And um, your first question was... Um, about the candidate that you candidate, to right. Yeah. So as I said, it's very controversial if you support criticism of Israel. And BDS can be considered criticism of, criticism of Israel. So politicians know this, so they, I guess it was... Maybe a, you should tell people, maybe everybody doesn't yeah, know talk what about BDS, BDS is. Sorry, BDS. BDS is Boycott, Divest, Sanction. So it's not against the Israeli people, per se. It's against corporations and institutions in Israel, which affects the people of Israel, yes. But the people of Israel and the government of Israel is usually two different things. But it should be one thing. The people of Israel should be agree with the government. Something like the people in America should agree with the government. Sometimes. But, okay, so BDS, it started in 2005 by a Palestinian groups, by human rights groups, academic groups, labor groups, um, science groups, history groups. They came together and they decided that they would try to sanction, boycott Israel, not by themselves, but try to get other people. Oh yeah, um, there have been student groups, I think in Ireland, agreed to go by BDS. There have been, uh, okay, there's a state law in, in Illinois that says that if anybody um, tries to boycott any country, which it's aimed at BDS against Israel. Uh, so if any, if any individual uh, does that, agrees with that, supports that, they can be put in jail. Now they, the, the governor did not sign it. There have been about 17 states, I think it is, that have similar laws, but nobody has been charged yet with being uh, pro-BDS. But I think it's, uh, I think it's a question of free speech. I mean, this is supposed to be free speech, and the government can decide that BDS is not free speech, but um, that's to be set, decided in court. Probably. Tim, I don't want to get there. Can I get Yes. You have quite a quite a, a, a grab bag of propaganda here. How deeply have you researched the actual claims made by this stuff? Claims by made by this stuff. Which stuff? Seriously. You 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 just presented a huge raft of, of claims about evils and activities and, and, and whatnot. Um, have you have you looked into history? Have you looked into bias? Have you, you know so on and so forth? Yeah. It's called research. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for asking. Um, 
because several of the things are, that, that you presented are simply wrong. Well, like like I said, like I sent out my reference sheet. Okay. Um, for instance, the uh, book by Thomas Suarez called State of Terror. Now, he he went into the England National Archives. So that, this was the uh, this was the uh, this was the uh, diplomats. Uh, communicating with London from the Middle East, right? Okay? So they were saying, I mean, they were saying the, the, the Zionists, Begin, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, etc., etc., Irgun, Irgun, they were blowing up people constantly. I know, this is the way states are created. You kill people. You kill, wait, let me finish. So that, that's the history that I saw, that I read about. And did, did you read about the history where the British stole 80 percent of Palestine and invented their own little kingdom for because they had a spare king? That Israel is actually 10 percent of the mandate of Palestine. Okay. Okay. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know. Let, 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 let go next. It has been said by you know people who support 9/11 and that there was an inside job by the Bush administration, that it, the Israeli government also too had inside information and that yeah. there were phone calls made okay. to the yeah. uh, Jewish yeah. right. contingent in, right. the, in the Trade Center. Right. Can you comment, please? Yeah, I can comment. Yeah. Not true. I mean, how are they going to, like there's a guy on the 100th floor, he's a bellman, he's a, he's a, he cleans the tables for the restaurant. Uh, there's a guy on the 67th floor that uh, is a stockbroker. There's a guy on the 30th floor who's a librarian. I mean, and you're telling me that a Jewish rabbi knew all their phone numbers and called them up and actually told them not to come? You know, I heard that from uh, a Pakistani <laughs> gas station owner. Ah. And he said, you know what he said? He said he read it in... Uh, uh, USA Today. Where did you hear about it? I've actually heard about it on the internet for a while, and I'm right. seeing that yeah, you yeah, think that older. claim is so <laughs> preposterous. Older, as I yeah. agree with, as I take it yeah. against me with Andy thinking it was an inside job by the Bush administration. Right. That's absolutely mm -hmm. preposterous, too. Right. All right. Okay. See, I don't want to. I know. Thank you, thank you. I'm kind of shy. Um, so, listen, my question is. What is your opinion? How much percent anti-Semitism in this country? How, how much? Per, if we take like hundred percent, how, well, okay. much, how many percent? Okay. What do you think? Yeah, okay. so Jews, first of all, Jews are maybe two percent of the population of the United States of America. Two yeah. percent. There might be six million Jews out of three hundred thirty million people. In Israel, there are six and a half million Jews and six and a half million Arabs, maybe. Christians and Muslims, mostly Muslims. Um, Do you remember the question? Yeah. I, I refuse to answer that. It's too crazy. No, it's a, it's a ridiculous question. I don't know, that, I don't know how to answer it. I don't know how to answer it. I don't know how to answer it. Uh, Andy, you have to answer it. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Pink, please. Yeah. Man, uh, what's your opinion uh, of Palestinians uh, rejecting the deal that uh, Clinton was brokering with uh, uh, Prime Minister Barack in 2000? And after that, they haven't gotten any offers of any kind of deals. Uh, did they make a mistake? Um, no, I don't think they made a mistake. They, they, have no, they have all the rights in the world to reject the uh, offer. Why not? Oh, it's so soft. And it, was it smart? It's too fancy. Maybe it was smart. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't want to. But, I mean, that's okay. The, that's okay. they have a right okay. to reject deals, you know? And why didn't, why didn't America yes, come up? Yes, it was smart. Okay. Yes, it was smart. I think it was very smart. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, Dan, uh, and I'm serious. I... Uh, what real real estate are we talking about? I mean, I tried looking up 
locating Palestine on a map of the world. Yeah. And I, I mean, and what what really, what sort of real estate are we talking about here? I, I, it sort of got me the impression that I, these guys are arguing about like a neighborhood. <coughs> I mean, well, it's that, uh, and, and this is like hard scribble land. I mean, what? What's your question? Is it that, isn't this like a minuscule piece of Okay, settlements? let me answer it. Can I answer it? Oh, yeah. Okay, there's, Palestinians have homes, right? They have a home, like, you have a home? Yeah. And they, have, they might have olive trees over here. And the Jews, or the Israelis, put a, a separation wall right in between their home and their olive trees. Olive trees, where they eat, where they not eat it, but they sell it for money to live on. So from that on, there's no, there's a separation wall. They can't get to their field. They can't get to their money. They can't raise money. So that is growing on the land in Israel today, right now. I showed you a picture, uh, and I, did, I showed you a picture of that date tree. I mean, there are, in Israel they grow things. It's like farmland, like here, like in Iowa, they have cornfields. And there they sell olives, uh, dates, and figs. And they sell them. And they, they sell all, all kinds of vegetables in Gaza right now. So, I mean, this is hard scrabble land. Yeah, but it's, it's valuable land, and Jews want it. And Jews are stealing the water from the land constantly and taking the land. Just like in America, they took the land from the Indians. What? Would you tell us about United Nations Resolution 181? Uh, remind me what that is. The United Nations Resolution that created Israel, that made Jerusalem an open city, that gave Israel two-thirds of the land it ended up with after the War of Independence, and that the Arabs totally rejected, and five Arab armies swept in to destroy the Jews. Resolution 181? Uh, that isn't quite the way I see it. Actually, in 1948, Jews were the Jews, the Israelis, after the state was made, they had a lot of arms, and they had support from Czechoslovakia. They had arms coming in for, yeah, they did. And they might have had arms from Russia and America at the same time, because Russia and America supported the state. And Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Jordan and Saudi Arabia also had arms? Yes, but they weren't as strong as Israel. They just weren't. I mean, look what happened. Israel won the war. I mean, so... So it's Israel's fault they didn't get annihilated. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. That's history. We the Zionists accepted a settlement that was very much against them, and the Arabs refused to accept it because they insisted on killing all the Jews. No. Now, the Arabs failed, but the original fact remained. People, you know, people, peoples who have fought each other have made peace with, with each other. In the past, they, they fought each other. This is the present, and they want to get together, they want to get along. So, no matter what the history is... Um, well, what about the civil war between Hamas and Fatah? You talked about the electricity. There's no electricity because Fatah steals the money to pay the electric bill. They'd rather pay off terrorists Hundreds of millions is a line item in the Fatah budget to pay off terrorists, but they won't pay the electric bill for Gaza because they're having a civil war with Hamas. But Israel's the bad guy because when the bill get, doesn't get paid, there's no electricity. Why is there no why is there a blockade on Gaza? Mm -hmm. Why is there a blockade on Gaza? There are ten thousand trucks a day go into Gaza. Right. What are you what do you mean blockade? There's the uh, Israeli Navy stops all boats. Stop yeah. Turkish. Bomb Turkish. Boat. Yeah, they bomb yeah. and kill people. I mean, in there. I mean, there's because a wall. Because Hamas is shooting, is building rockets. Well, wall. see, if they give if they give civil rights to the Arabs, I think there might be some but a, peace. But Hamas is using schools for arsenals, no. and you say that Israel's the bad guy. You know, How about they, Hamas? That whole thing. That whole thing about schools and hospitals and children, you know, yeah. daycare centers holding missiles, it was it was found to be a lie. F, F, yes, it was. Unrefound well, weapons in, in schools and getting back. Hiding weapons. Okay. Let's get to the Any next. more questions? Next person. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Questions? Yeah.
Yeah. Let's, let's yes. Yes. Is there any difference the way they speak Palestinian Muslim versus Palestinian Christian? Christian, I think um, Christians came to America first. Palestinian Christians. No, I don't think so. You mean in Israel? Yes, and the and the West Bank. I don't. I don't really know. I don't know. But I know Palestinian Christians came to America before Palestinian Muslims. Uh, Daniel. Oh, no, I'm really really no. In Israel, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll find out. Okay, who else? Yeah. Mr. Bing. So, uh, uh, Palestinians that live in Israel and are citizens, yes. are they treated differently than the Jewish uh, citizens? A little. Well, how so? A little. There's discrimination, like anybody. Like, uh, can they vote? I understand they can vote in the national election. I think so, yes. It's kind of, yes. All right, Jeff, you got this guy. This guy. All right, Jeff. So, um, actually, you heard that uh, Palestinian Christians were actually, in fact, uh, treated a little bit differently than uh, Palestinian Muslims. Palestinian Muslims, of course, were treated a lot harshly. Um, so, unfortunately, I do not have my facts straight, but I've come across a couple of articles online uh, that have said that the Israeli army uh, has made certain deals with uh, Palestinian Christians to get them more on their side rather than Palestinian Muslims. Uh, that could be true. So, um, that's just like something to... You know, keep in mind. Okay. Uh, Who else? Who else has a question? 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 Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the talk. And have you ever heard about revisionist Zionism? And um, one of them. I mean, I like I have the book ISIS is us. I mean, a lot of the research I've read is implies that in some way the Israeli state creates ISIS or Hamas in order to keep this. They don't really want peace. I think. Um, I don't know. Uh, also, if you could comment on the propaganda of. I mean, it's difficult to be called anti-Semitic when you're trying to just talk about peace. I, I don't know if you have any suggestions or comments. Well, uh, people, there are organizations like the Anti-Defamation League and the American Jewish Committee who, and the Israeli government who go after people like me who put forth the Palestinian side. And they're going to say I'm anti-Semitic, yeah. self-hating Jew, but I don't think I am. Anyways, and the second thing, um, the United States has uh, the ISIS. Or I Hamas. Think, uh -huh. Hamas, yeah. Um, no, I don't think Israel has created the Hamas. I think... Uh, Hamas, well, they were elected to be leaders of Gaza, right? Um, so they're kind of a legitimate political organization. Um, some people are shaking their heads. Well, I mean, the United States government could be thought of as a very violent terrorist organization also. But they do peaceful things all over the world, too. Anyways, so. But... Uh, as far as Hamas, no, I don't, I, uh, anti-Semitism is a touchy subject. Maybe for another time I could talk about that. Yes? <coughs> you know, in many instances, if you even question some of the Israeli policies, mm -hmm. or even question it, not just criticize it, even wait you automatically tend to be labeled anti-Semite. Right. Have you been labeled anti-Semite? Yes, I was reading a poem in uh, Open Mic 
in a bar in Chicago, <laughs> and I read a poem by an Arab, and somebody called me anti-Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's so, not your name. I mean, I, in in, in the Begin and Shamir in 1930s, they were killing Jews who didn't agree with them. Maybe they, they had guns. They both both of them had guns with them, but uh, I don't have any guns, so maybe I won't get killed. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, Charlie. Is it really? What's the deal on this? Anything the U.S. Embassy to? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a theatrical move. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the Knesset is, is it in, the, in the Jerusalem or is it in Tel Aviv? The Knesset, where they, the Congress meets. Yes, you know? Yeah, it's different. You're the one who you're, did the research. <laughs> you know, somebody should Google up where the Knesset is. But, I think it's just a Zionist move by by Trump, just to uh, show Netanyahu that yeah. right? they, it's for show. Yeah. Sheldon Adelson. Sheldon, Sheldon Adelson. Yeah, who might pay for it, like a hundred million dollars. Mm. Um, no, he ain't gonna pay for it. Hmm. Well, I have a question. Yes. He already made his payment. <laughs> With Trump went to the Israel, yeah. what did he do exactly? What did he, he, he said this is the Israel state. Right. So, is he the first president that did that? I don't think so, no. So, what was the big deal? Well, he said that the embassy is going to be moved to Jerusalem. From Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's difficult, right? Yeah, that's uh, something different. People are protesting. Yeah. Right. The Palestinians. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 7.30. Do you want to continue answering questions or do you want to get into rebuttals? I'll, I'll answer a few more questions. If nobody's got them, we'll just Okay, get that's it. We'll go to rebuttals. All right. How many All we're right. going to... All right. Thank, hey, thank you for speaking tonight. Let's give another round of applause for our speaker. Andy, get up here and set up the rebuttals. This is a free speech forum. Yeah, we know. All right. Yeah. How many tonight want to speak? Okay, we're going to try five minutes each because we do have some time. So uh, I'll uh, hopefully Andy will be keeping time here in a minute or two. But uh, you know, let's make it about five minutes or so. Please keep it cogent. Why? Charlie, because if you want to get up here and waste six minutes of time. And, and, and say absolutely nothing. That's your prerogative. But we don't be at the down. down. You could yeah. talk as long as you wanted. So you, man. Yeah. You yeah, but there was no time limit. Now we got nobody here, yeah. nobody demanding your time, yet you're putting a cap on it. That makes no sense. Well, at all. some people need to be capped. Yeah, some people need to be capped. Well, let them know. <laughs> all right. You need to be capped. That's what it's called a chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, some people need to be kept. I mean, it makes no sense if you got as much, as much time to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm out of here by 9 o'clock. Uh -huh. yeah. Out of the sky? And we got to be out of here by 9 o'clock. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, just because you're not in our city. Let's get started. <laughs> All right, let's go. Will, will the timekeeper please give me a 30 second warning? I will do so. You can talk as long as you want. Five minutes worth. Um, the Native Americans have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Israel. Hello. Um, it, it, one out of five Israeli citizens is Arab. They have full civil rights. They sit in high positions in government. They are elected to high office. They serve as judges. 
They have a higher standard of living. They have a longer life expectancy than the citizens of any Arab country. So this apartheid nonsense is a fraud. The Palestinians, because the idea that these are separate people is a, is a modern invention, um, are the great political football of the Arab world. After World War II, 30 million displaced persons were resettled. 1% of that total were imprisoned in displaced person, persons camps permanently to be used as political footballs. From Morocco to Iraq, the Arab world would not take in a couple of hundred thousand people. Meanwhile, the Arab world expelled all of its Jews. Communities older than the Roman Empire were completely eradicated. Israel, with not a, with not a pot to piss in, had to take in close to a million refugees from the Arab world. The land that they owned that was stolen by the various Arab countries probably totaled several times the area of Israel. When the League of Nations gave the mandate of Palestine to Britain, a couple years later, Britain just took 80% of it and invented the Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan yeah. because they had a spare king and so they made a kingdom for it. In 1948, when five Arab armies tried to exterminate Israel and got their asses handed to them, Jordan did manage to conquer the West Bank and conquer Jerusalem, which they annexed totally illegally, completely expelled, 100% expelled the Jewish population of Jerusalem, turned the neighborhood into a garbage dump, desecrated the cemeteries, and destroyed the synagogues. This after UN Resolution 181, which the Zionists agreed to very unfavorable terms for them. So all of this business about these poor, poor, victimized Arabs, the victimizers are the Arabs. Hamas is a bloodthirsty gang of thugs and crooks. Fatah is a bloodthirsty gang of crooks and thugs. They're having a slow motion civil war, and the people of Gaza are getting it in the net. Sure, Operation Cast Lead blew some stuff up. He did not show you slides of the thousands of missiles that Hamas shot randomly into populated areas of Israel. He did not show you the gigantic mansions that the owners of Fatah live in on the West Bank. And yes, there is a, a line item in the budget for pensions for martyrs. If you go to Israel and blow yourself up, your family gets a pension forever, and the more colorful your, your, your suicide and the more people you take with you, the bigger a pension they get. It's right there in the budget, and it's supported by international aid to the Palestinians. They have their own special United Nations Refugee Agency, UNRWA, unlike any other refugees in the world. Now, if you are pro-Palestinian, then you're anti-Hamas. If you are pro-Palestinian, you are anti-Fatah, because they are bloodsuckers. They are, are, are victimizers, exploiters, thieves, and killers. If the only people who mistreat the Palestinians and get you excited are the Israelis, then you're an anti-Semite. You're not pro-Palestinian, and you're a liar. Now, I'm, an, I'm a, a, an American. I'm a Chicagoan. I love my country. Unfortunately, my country's government right now is dangerously insane. I also love Israel. Unfortunately, Israel's government is dangerously insane. Yeah. When I, I speak of Israel and Israel's government, they are two separate things. And he just waved me a zero. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next. You got the, yeah, you got the time now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, Neil just shows you how uh, difficult and complicated this uh, 
whole topic is, uh, it's good of uh, Dan to bring it to uh, the com College of Complexes because we are the forum for these kind of difficult subjects. Um, I, uh, um, I can go both ways. I can see both sides of the argument. Um, when I was uh, uh, researching my uh, uh, play, uh, doing the research on the Holocaust for the play I wrote uh, about uh, Auschwitz, um, and uh, uh, I, I met uh, one of my good friends at that time, uh, Belle Kerman. Um, she was uh, involved in the theater uh, community and uh, also uh, invited me to a Seder, a couple of Seders actually, and, uh, and uh, a reading of the Zophar. <laughs> I can't remember the exact name of it, but uh, I learned something about uh, Jewish culture and history uh, at that time. And um, uh, you could have said, you know, that I was, I was an honorary Jew at one time because I was very deep into that subject. But uh, I never lost sight of the fact that uh, this was a very complicated topic. Now, my good friend, uh, Bell, um, in the mid-1990s was co-sponsor of the event which uh, involved uh, Jews for uh, peace and uh, or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact name of any of the organizations involved, but there was like a dinner and there were Palestinians and Jews present. And uh, I remember very uh, strongly that, uh, gee, some of this Palestinian food, uh, it had curry in it. It was very similar to the Indian food that cuisine that uh, my mother always brought us up on. Uh, uh, she was uh, uh, born in India to missionaries. She was not of uh, Eastern Indian descent um, or necessarily of Native American descent, although supposedly um, maybe she was 128th and I'm supposed to be 264th or something in Native Indian. But uh, that does bring me briefly to the fact that Native Americans um, uh, versus uh, Palestinians, there are some parallels and um, of course, uh, the difference is that Native Americans were here vastly before the Europeans came and had much more of a claim in that respect to the land. And the Jews uh, had a claim, supposedly, that they were kicked out of the Palestinian area and they were coming back to it. And so they were claiming to have a prior right. Uh, but if we were to use that kind of a, of a legal standard, then how far could we go back? I mean, we would have to, every time archaeologists discovered that a certain group had come from one area, um, uh, they would suddenly, they'd be the owners of that area, and so anyone who was genetically connected with them would say, well, we've got to go there and kick everyone out from there. So it, there would be no, it would never end. That kind of an argument really is very difficult to find um, any solutions to. Now, um, this is such a difficult subject, there's so many things I could talk about. Um, I could see both sides because I attended that. Um, I, I read things about it. I made my, my own minds. I attended that um, the event that my friend had set up. Um, I know that in the 90s and um, up to the early 2000s, it looked like there might have been a solution. I alluded to that in my question that, uh, that the Palestinians really uh, threw away a, a possibility to make progress on their side. Uh, the problem is these hatreds that are involved, uh, people not being able to reconcile, even to the next second or third generation, the fact that injustices occurred on both sides in the uh, years leading up to 1948 and, and subsequently. And uh, if we keep on uh, going that route, I mean, we in this country could go back to all of the, um, the massacres uh, that occurred uh, of uh, settlers uh, back in colonial times and the, the massacres of Native Americans. We could just endlessly debate those things. There's no solution in that, in that way. The only solution is some kind of reconciliation. And uh, I had thought in the mid-1990s that there might have been a solution if you could just somehow find out uh, amongst the people there uh, who is really able to come to a reconciliation. And, I really was almost at the point where I was, you know, saying, well, what we may, might have to do is go with lie detector tests of, of the people there. Now, of course, that would be very controversial if, if anyone suggested anything like that. Um, but uh, how do you get to the point where you can um, uh, somehow segregate the people that are in such hatred that they can't accept any reconciliation, and some that are in these groups that uh, Neil brought up um, and that were uh, talked about? 
um, during the regular uh, course of the uh, of the lecture. Uh, how do you get to some kind of uh, a way to um, deal with the people that have such hatred in their hearts that they won't accept the solution on either side? Uh, the first ones to recognize Israel as a state was the Russian Soviet bloc when Czechoslovakia gave arms to Israel and Soviet Russia recognized Israel as a state right away, which was previously owned by the British and the French in Syria. So the imperialist powers, after a certain period of time, especially the United States, recognized in Israel as being a safe place as far as the United States was concerned, because the United States had very deep interest in the oil in these states. And even though they were reactionary states, the United States after a while recognized that and um, realized that if Israel wasn't there, the uh, area wouldn't be too stable. Like, for instance, if you take any of the Arab states like Egypt or uh, Saudi Arabia or any of those places, there might be a revolution in these places and the United States and France and Britain would be kicked out. So the United States looks at Israel as being a very safe place because it protects American oil interests for the most part. But um, the way I look at it is, right now you have a reactionary government in the United States and in Israel and other parts of the Arab world, like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and some of the emirates in those areas. So it uh, feels safe from protecting. But what I, what I see essentially is, at first, you wouldn't have a type of state that was uh, organized along the lines of, uh, let's say, a democracy. At first, you would have Israel becoming a state and Palestine being recognized by Israel as a state. And eventually, what I see is that eventually they could be integrated and you call you could call it Israel Palestine or Palestine Israel but for the most part you don't want to see wars 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 and these people killing each other and that would be the best way and if somebody believes in religion well they could have their religion but they won't have anything to do with a state there won't be a theocracy Israel, it's unfinished business from World War II. Uh, they still have work to do. Uh, I'm not a Palestinian, I'm not Israel, I'm not Jewish, I'm Quaker. Um, and it hurts me. So I got a couple forms of oh, yeah. Israel and Palestine. They don't like each other here or there. They don't like each other anywhere. <laughs> Do they know each other here or there? Do they know each other anywhere? Do they know each other heart to heart? Do they know each other from the start? Do they know each other other's pain? Do they know each other's constraint? Do they know each other's no they don't and no they won't. They won't know each other here or there. They won't know each other anywhere. Can they meet each other here or there? Can they meet each other anywhere? Yes, they can meet each other here or there. They can meet each other anywhere. They can meet each other in a park. 
They can meet each other in the dark. Yes, they can meet each other. Can they know each other? Yes, they can. Can they like each other? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. <laughs> All right. Israel's, Israel's continued war and fear. Palestine's continued suffering and anger, each kept in place by ignorance of the other. There is a war. Both think the other is the enemy. There is a war. Both think the other is the enemy. Many hurt and killed. And for what? Israel's fear is shared by death and destruction of Palestinians. Neither knowing who the other people are, answer lays at a deeper level. Neither seems to be willing to know. If this were done, the whole world would realize that violence is unnecessary. It does not solve the problem of getting to know that other side. The sides kept in place by ignorance, hurt, and fear. There needs to be a way to become acquainted, working together, creating peaceful place. This can be done. Both are in this together. It is not this or that <coughs> side, but both. But both. How does it start? Bringing down the walls of hate and hurt and fear. Connecting, understanding, very small steps that move beyond the sides they're on. Israel and Palestine, are they willing to pay the full price for peace? I wonder about that. Yes. It's not us or them, it's both together. Knowing each other at a deeper level. Knowing the hurt and pain who these other people are, and beyond the labels, shout of shouting that's been going on, and also guns and throwing rocks and who knows what else. Israel, is Israel willing to pay the reparations to Palestinians so peace is possible? Are Palestinian people uh, willing to acknowledge Israel beyond their suffering so peace is possible? It is possible for Paul to live there in peace the full price to know each other. The full price. The path toward peace is a path to know, appreciate, and love. It is a path to tame the other. There is nothing to fight, nothing to fear. If they know who that other is, they will know there is an opportunity to be with each other in ways not known before. All right. Very good. Who's next? Next rebuttal? I'm going. All right, Ellen. You. No, I'm not. Uh, All right, pick this guy up. You're done. You five minutes. Yeah. Why? Why is there a cap on the speaking today when there's nobody speaking? No, we're just uh, so roughly five minutes. Apiece. It's completely so you want to hear arbitrary. Oh, 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 All right. Let's have a let's have a, 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 a yeah. limit for no other reason than they have a limit. Yeah. Charlie, you're wrong. Yeah. No, I'm not. Let him speak. I'm going to get there and talk for 20 minutes, and I'll be, God damn it, you're going to stop me. <laughs> hey, no. You can take a no, you don't oh, give me some logic. We pay up front. <laughs> Just go ahead. It's so funny. We take a bone to see how many people to allocate the time fairly. Now, when the other thing is plenty of time, you put the cap on it anyway. Why? Probably because it's stupid. So if you didn't, not, there wouldn't be enough time. All if right. we have time left over, people can come up and have you a second You didn't even time. ask how many people. See, this is, an, this is just what we're talking about, why Israel and Palestine does not have peace. You have two people who are just obstinate in their views and don't want to bend. I honestly think that Israel and Palestine want the state of affairs. And if you're Israel, if you're Israel, you have getting money and aid from the United States. You have uh, an enemy that they can then get their corrupt government, I mean, their democratic government behind. And 
the thing is, they then can get the technology, the aid from the United States, and the stability that they need to be a running democracy by having and, and a, a place where they can get their industry going by needing arms. Likewise, the Palestinians, because they have a corrupt government, and they have a thing, benefit as well. They can then take and blame everything on their common enemy, the Israelis. And the two of them, yet at the same time, the Palestinians are good enough to work in Israel, but yet not live there and have to go through a lengthy process of uh, whatever. Yeah, I think that it may be for the both that uh, they really don't want peace. They just want to keep the status quo as is. There's a few people that get taken care of with terrorism, but I think with the Israeli government, they got a propaganda tool that keeps them in power, and the, is, and the, uh, and the uh, Hamas and Fatah have also two of the same power to keep themselves. It would be much harder for them to have peace than it is with the current state of affairs. It's easy to stay at war and name an enemy and not blame your own corruption on yourselves and reform versus having peace and then having the people look at you and then having to reform. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Merrick. I'm a Christian and my I'm German, Irish, Scottish, Norwegian, French, and English, so I'm not, not sure why I'm up here. I may be half Nazi for all I know from my dad's side. And I, I, see, uh, I see a bunch of old people, I uh, look at them and then I say, oh, I went to school with them. So, this is Saturday, College of Complexes. Okay. Palestinian, meaning your top Palestinian decision-making body, faces more boycotts. That was online recently. Today, 14 hours ago, maybe 15 hours ago now, Palestine urged, urges UN to respond to killing or protesting by Sorry. Israel. Sorry. Gaza official accuses senior Palestine intel officer in blast. Palestine officially, the state of Palestine is a, a dual your sovereign state in the Middle East, claiming the West Bank and Gaza Strip with East Jerusalem as the designated capital. Although its administrative center is located in Ramallah, capital East Jerusalem. Proclaimed capital, administrative center, Jerusalem East, Ramallah. Bordering countries are Israel and Jordan. King David named Jerusalem the capital. That's all for now, folks. All right. Thank you. Hi, uh, Ellen Corley. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. That was great. Uh, I, uh, Dan was one of the first people I met in the, when I started coming here a year or two ago. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I know we talked about kind of rent and uh, peace and art. And, um, you know, I do think it's, it's an important subject. And I, I, pers I also know I think at this stage of our life, we have to take a stand. We have to speak out, and it's particularly hard. I speak out against my stepfather's, really the values I was taught by him. You know, when you're a kid, you go along with it. But uh, now, as I've gotten older, I've realized it's, it's like corruption or something. I, he was um, pro-Israel, uh, really, and it, you know, it's there's money in, it, to me, it's divided up between the managers, the managers' revolution, and the labor. And um, you know, Burnham, James Burnham, and uh, was funded by the CIA. A lot of the neocons were funded. Uh, they're aligned with Israel, with Rothschilds, the banking, the media. There, uh, that's where the money is, and it's hard to go against that. It's there's not much money in it. And you know, there's been a war on essentially on communism. And uh, the research I was listening to tonight, Eustace Mullins, 
very controversial. I think he was killed basically for uh, speaking so profoundly about he. The argument he made is that the Zionists are essentially like the Nazis versus the anti-Zionists. Basically, the ones that were killed were the anti-Zionists. Um, the you know those. Uh, those death camps uh, were more in Russia, Poland, and the, the Sunum, whatever, you know, there were, there was an aspect to which the Zionists were could conceivably been there. Uh, it's, you know, I do think, really, to understand history, we have to look at our part in it. You know, the English, the Southerners, whatever, you know, it really is, Really, the only way we're going to end it is we have to take responsibility for, for you know, the oppression, the repression. I'm involved now with the Alliance Against Racist Political Repression. I, I learned so much from understanding the black experience, you know, how COINTELPRO, when it's funded by the state, you've got absolute power you know, um, corrupting absolutely the way the FBI shot uh, and killed um, Fred Hampton, uh, you know, and, and it's all still denied by our state. Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, uh, you name it. Um, it's a uh, lie about it, big lies, that's what Hitler said. Um, once you have the media, the big lies are easier than the little ones. And, uh, it, you know, it's like Emperor's New Clothes. It, but um, I think if we all speak out, or at least keep debating these things without intimidation, uh, with honesty to ourselves and others, we, uh, we've got a chance. Thank you. I'll take the next rebuttal. I'll be short. Charlie's going to wrap it up tonight after uh, Jonathan. Yes. So, no rush. Uh, yeah, if there's no rush, why are we limiting it to five minutes? <laughs> well, that's so you can have 20 minutes to wrap it up. 30 Charlie. seconds. Why is there no rush? 30 seconds. We're not on rush street. There's no rush. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but it's five minutes. That makes a lot of sense. Quick, your squad. We try. Uh, I would like to first off thank our speaker for a good presentation on. Uh, some of the facts on the ground of what's happening over there. Um, I would also like to mention that language matters. To say that what's happening to the Palestinians is unfortunate is like saying what happened at Pearl Harbor was unfortunate. It doesn't quite capture the essence of what's going on. <laughs> I agree. I'd like to say I agree 100% with what Neil said about the Israeli government and the American government being totally dangerous and insane, right? Is that about what you said, Neil? Uh, dangerously insane? Likud and Hamas are codependent. Now look what you made me do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> good. Currently, uh, there are articles all over highly credible websites about <laughs> the Israeli snipers using Palestinian children for target practice. This is not some kind of myth. Uh, it's a way to keep the hatred going because if you step back and look at the big picture, if peace broke out in the Middle East and other countries, a few countries would lose, a, a, few, con a few corporations, a few multi-billion dollar, <laughs> multi-trillion dollar corporations would lose trillions of dollars in war profits. The, the war is profitable all over the planet. General Smedley Butler wrote that in 1935 when he retired. And with each passing year now and the reprinting of that book, it becomes more and more obvious that there are certain entities that are maintaining us in a state of war in order to make profits. Killing people is profitable in America today. And uh, the, the, the drug companies are especially good at it. Uh, we're sorry your child is dying because you can't afford the $5,000 medicine per week, but it's not personal, it's just business. We need our billions. Uh, it's nothing personal against you or your children, it's just business. 
There's an article today, a, a, a man named, uh, last name is Mayer or something, is a human rights activist from somewhere in Europe, a, a name I'm not familiar with, but he's been a long time activist and he, he wrote that I'm not writing about, uh, you know, protests or the environment anymore because it's over. Everything that's been said, everything that needs to be said has been said. If the human race doesn't act, the methane melts out of the water, the sea levels come up 20 feet, the planet warms up 12, 15 degrees in the next 30 years. The science on this is very, very, very solid. We're going to hear somebody that takes the flat earth ignorance side of it come here and give a speech that we have pseudoscience on global warming <laughs> while we're watching Texas, Miami, other places get flooded with 25,000 year odds on floods. They're getting flooded out every other year because of the climate change. <clears throat> what I would like to say is when your house is burning down or it's on fire, you don't concentrate on fixing a loose doorknob or a rusty hinge somewhere. All of these things, these little wars going on, uh, contained just constant steady state of warfare like what George Orwell wrote about, or a constant war. Uh, this is to keep our attention off the one driving central issue of our time now. Do our grandchildren have any right to grow up on a planet where it's possible for humans to survive anymore? They're not talking about a little bit of environmental discomfort. They're talking about basically the extinction of 90% of species on the world, including the human species, before this century is out. And we will know in five years whether we've uh, reached the tipping point because as the permafrost in uh, Russia and other places begins to warm up, methane that's frozen in the soil melts. Mm -hmm. And there's methane crystals uh, in, in cold water uh, frozen in the oceans. When you know, all you need is a couple of degrees of warming and the methane starts to melt and rise into the atmosphere, it's 20 times worse than carbon dioxide for global warming. So they're talking, if you do an, I did a Google search today, search this term, methane burp. That's what they're calling it, a great methane burp over six months or a year. It's happened twice in our ancient past and each time it was uh, extinction for 90% of the species on the planet as the methane warmed the planet up 10 degrees. So that's where we are and we have five years or less to get a World War II mobilization going at all levels. With World War II, the automotive industry, our industry, stopped making cars. They made everything to win World War II in four years. They mobilized and we said we went that crisis and that's what needs to be done right now. Uh, how many people, let's have a show of hands here, how many people know that there's a revolution going on in Puerto Rico and what is it? They're starting to the They're starting in China right now. Well, yeah, specifically, <laughs> Puerto Rico is being blacked out by the news. Blacked out. They are going solar, you know, what yeah. Harvey Wasserman refers to as a green solar topian future. The, the island is converting very fast to independent solar power, and the American media is running a total blackout on it to keep Americans from finding out that solar power is now cheaper than utility power virtually anywhere in the world. And so, thank you. That's uh, that's about all I have to say. And um, log on to Common Dreams every day if you want to see the best of the best progressive mainstream news that's science and fact-based rather than a lot of propaganda from either side. Thank you all. All right, Jonathan. Andy, thanks for the rebuttal. Mr. Jonathan. That's my goal. I've never been uh, to the region of planet Earth uh, that was discussed this evening. Uh, I wish I, I wish I could go to Palestine and Israel and talk to the people there. Um, the first people I would talk to is the youth, or the young adults. A lot of people who are young don't like the term youth, they like the term young adults. One place I have been to is Illinois. I was born and raised here. And uh, as a great grandson of two people who had to immigrate from Poland to Chicago in 1901 and hide their religion because they knew that there was serious violent consequences, financial consequences, uh, 
housing situation consequences, etc. If you revealed your religion, uh, it was not easy for great grandpa John and great grandma to survive that time. Uh, so I grew up at the height of Reaganism in high school, and uh, one of my best friends was named Josh Bird. Josh Bird went to the mosque in Villa Park, and I went to my uh, progressive Lutheran church on the other side of town, on the north side, went to the south side. But uh, all those policies and propaganda of Ronald Reagan and Daddy Bush and uh, Dick Cheney uh, couldn't divide the youth. And I know it's true because me and Josh didn't know anything about politics. We didn't know about in these times or the progressive or the nation. We didn't know where Revolutionary Books was in downtown Chicago. We didn't know about the Democratic Socialist America. We knew that we loved to go to the park, play basketball, and watch Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Good. And one of, the, one of the players that's never mentioned, but he just came out with a great book called Long Shot, Craig Hodges. If you want to read a great book about how hard it is to talk about how the United States manipulates policy in the Middle East, read Long Shot by Craig Hodges, uh, NBA three-point champion of our beloved Chicago Bulls in their championship years. So uh, we would hang out and have pizza and laugh and talk about what teachers we liked and didn't like and what girls in class we liked and didn't like. And uh, it didn't matter that he was Muslim and that I was of one-fourth, at least that we know of, because it was so silenced in our family, we had to kind of like almost investigate it, Jewish. Uh, and he was black and I was white. There were all these things where they couldn't divide and conquer us. Uh, so yeah. Uh, the people always win, and especially the youth. So this is for the youth of the world, because it can be done in anywhere if you can do it in Illinois. Born in Hell War, Child Fallen For. Remember that speech about bombs and scoreboards. Born into war, child killed poor. Rest in the peace you now afford. Who are we to be so free of people, believing the lights at the end of the tunnel? Born all out war, chat no more. Rest not without the peace we hear you implore. Born nameless war, child lost poor. Rest in the peace we say this plea torn. Who are we to be so free of people, believing the lights at the end of the tunnel? Born unjust war, children's lives mourned. Blessed are we to lessen the force. Born against war, child blood poor. Never repeat past little life yours. Who are we to be so free of people, believing the lights at the end of the tunnel? Born only knowing war, child's cry roars. Best guarantee, let the peacemakers have the floor. Born in hell war, children fallen for. Remember, we're only our will away from that day that we all dream for. Um, when I think about someday going to the Middle East and going to places where there are no more borders and no more governments and no more uh, separations from each other or annexations from each other or divisions from each other, uh, I can't wait to hear some of the music and some of the writing and some of the poetry of the youth of planet Earth, and I don't need to know what religion they are, and I don't need to know what side of town they live on, because uh, me and me and Josh Burt, uh, we know what they're thinking. This is crazy that the adults in the room are making all these decisions for the rest of us, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm thinking about my friend Josh Burt from high school tonight, thinking. Peace on earth is only our will away. Uh, we're going to win this because we're the people and the powers that be. Uh, we got them in a checkmate. They just don't know it yet. All right. All right. I like this.
Well, thank you to Dan for a great presentation. I apologize for being late. I didn't hear all of it, but I know from what I heard that we're basically on the same page on a lot of these issues. Very sympathetic with uh, his views. Uh, I've heard Brant Rosen speak before anyone who's interested in this should look him up. And he has a book called uh, Wrestling in the Daylight. Uh, he's a rabbi that's over a period of time became uh, very concerned with Israeli policies. Um, Neil, Neil and I have crossed swords before on this and other issues, <laughs> and I didn't think we were going to agree on anything tonight, but by gosh, we did. I certainly agree that both of our governments are crazy, and I agree that uh, Hamas and Fatah are very corrupt, very not very interested, or more interested, let's put it this way, in their own interests, political and, and economic, than the interests of the Palestinian people. And that is, uh, that is not helping the situation over there. Uh, and as far as Tim goes, uh, I agree with him. Uh, this war could go on for a long time because both sides seem to feel that it's to their interest. Yeah. Governments as a whole have to have a wedge, something, a hammer to hold over people's heads. And usually it involves fear. We had our government in the Cold War for decades, and other governments pick other things to uh, make their people fear. And in, in uh, Israel and Palestine, it's fearing each other like and the hating each hopes. other. So, so it's quite possible that these that the leaders feel that uh, peace is not their real goal, even though they say they do. Now, years ago, Arafat and I believe it was Ehud Barak met. Uh, in this country, I think it was called Y River, and uh, a lot of the pundits, including our press and, and so forth, said, oh, Ar Arafat missed the boat. This was his best chance for peace. He should have agreed with the, with the deal that uh, Ehud Barak offered, and that it was considered to be a, an offer, a very generous offer on the part of Israel. And he was even under some criticism back in Israel over it, but Arafat said no, he would not sign it. Why? Well, there is a sizable group of people among Palestinians uh, who don't want peace because they don't believe uh, that, that uh, any part of the land should belong to Israel. They believe that all of the land was stolen, and they will for a long time. It could be many generations before we get over that. I think Arafat had to deal with that, even though he might have liked to have had the peace. And as far as U.S. goes, why, why is it on popular and uncommon uh, for people to protest Israel here in this country. Uh, the few reasons. First of all, APAC has a lot of influence. It's, a, it's a, basically the Israeli lobby, and it's very powerful, one of the more powerful uh, lobbying groups in the country. Uh, and U.S. elections can sometimes turn on just a few votes, and so the politicians are very careful not to offend specific groups that are likely to vote for or against them because of their stance on a particular issue. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, leaders uh, that support Israel have done a very good job uh, of, of giving uh, extra power. It's not a, it's a case where a minority has disproportionate power. and, and, and uh, Jewish Americans having some disproportionate power is not the only one. I mean, we look at Cubans, we can look at a lot of other groups that have disproportionate power because they're well organized. But I think that has a big effect on uh, politicians and their willingness to talk. Now, universities, our universities and colleges are supposed to be the ultimate free speech forum. Outside, of course, of the college, <laughs> but uh, they are. The, we're supposed to be, be allowed to have free speech, and I've asked this question in forums, and say, absolutely. We, if we can't have free speech here at a university, where can we have it? But at least three universities in our area have bowed to this issue. Uh, university of Chicago, with regard to John Mersheimer, uh, DePaul, with regard to Norman Finkelstein. Uh, and uh, the University of Illinois with regard to Stephen Salida. These were all cases where money, where the, uh, the issue was uh, uh, brought up because they said things that were perceived to be uh, anti-Israel, not, not favorable to, to uh, Israel. 
and and uh, you know, in in some cases, uh, they they were, but they were very objective and they were uh, rigorously researched. Um, and uh, now Stephen Salida asked him a question to talk about this, and uh, because of the the assumption was that donors, particularly Jewish donors, would stop giving money to the university if he were hired. And he said, no, it's not the money. He said, uh, two or three million dollars a year to uh, the University of Illinois is chump change. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> I didn't think that was chump change. But he said, no, it's a, there's a different, there's a corporatization of academia that is taking place. And that's that was the main issue in why he was uh, not hired and paid off uh, to leave. And uh, I myself have been accused of being an anti-Semite by from some of my Jewish friends uh, for taking views and making statements like I'm making tonight. Uh, later, later, uh, most apologize, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's a very controversial issue, and you do have to uh, you do have to be very careful. And uh, I think it's one that it's very complicated, and it's going to be a long-term uh, problem. Oh, one more thing uh, with regard to what Andy said, uh, talking about a methane burp. I always thought that was just a technical term for a fart. <laughs> so no farting. All right. <laughs> no farting. All right. Just a reminder, we've got the literature there, so help yourself. Perhaps at this time, uh, before we close up, of uh, our uh, pernicious literature in the back of the room. Uh, and first of all, let's thank Dan for a very good presentation there. Really, I thought it was very good. You, you mixed yeah, it up a good bit and covered the issues here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Son, when can you be non-eclectic? First of all, I was going to thank you two guys for what you do, but tonight I'm going to have to tell you a little lesson here. Okay. Now, we advertise the college complex is having three parts. Right. A presentation, a question and answer period, and rebuttals and remarks. Now, for 10 years, at least 10 years, if not longer, we asked for a show of hands of how many people there are that would like to give a rebuttal. We take the amount of time remaining, divide the number of people in, and then allocate the time. So that we try to guarantee at least five minutes, and sometimes we've had to go less. But always that. For some reason, those rules were not applied tonight. You're right. I'm Absolutely right. not. And you're now, right. Now, the college today, pal, I'm talking. The college used to begin at 9 o'clock, and you could talk as long as you wanted. And nobody said anything. We'd go to 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock. You're not interested in this topic, so you want to go home, I guess, to watch the Cowboys open. So you cut this short. I can read into that, pal, and if I'm wrong, correct me. But this is the way it works. Now, during the week, somebody called me up and they wanted to speak, and they wanted to change the format. I said, no, sir, that's not going to happen. And I declined. And they said, well, I said, come back to me with some ideas. If you want to talk as a regular format, you're certainly welcome to. He said, thank you, I will. But during the week, I this is the, the way we, this is the standard operating procedure. If we have 60 minutes for rebuttal, I came here to learn about Israel and Palestine, even if it means listening to Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you other clowns. <laughs> I'm serious. I want to hear. I there are people who show up who know this topic. I don't know it. I came here to learn. And I don't need to have it curtailed for arbitrary and capricious reasons, which I don't understand. I don't see any reason. We got this place till 845, mm -hmm. and the service is a nice young lady right. until such time. And there's no reason to cut it short until then. Anyhow, enough to bitch in here. Well, uh, I there is a Charlie, All right, what do you got to say? I apologize for breaking protocol and not doing what was required before the rebuttals. I mean, there are people who know this topic. Yes. And on many occasions, we've had people show up who mm -hmm. know the topic as well, if not better than the speaker. And you're right, Charlie. And they're I was worth wrong. listening to, too. I'm glad they come. Americans. We want them to come. And yes. then we're going to cut them off? 
So you're right. I was wrong in breaking protocol. Right. Right. Believe Let's it. Let's move on. There is a similar situation in another part of the world. Does anybody know what it is? They've probably forgotten about it. North and South Korea. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, yeah. You're not even close. It's in Asia. Tibet. Oh yeah. Tibet. That's right. What's happening? Where the Chinese are coming in and taking over the land of the Tibetans. So they claim. Chinese claim that it's always been China's. And the Tibetans say they have a sovereign state. And uh, they say you weren't here before, why are you doing there now? <coughs> Stuff like this. Very similar arguments, the territorial arguments uh, that go back. You could go either way on this, you know. But that's the one that I know about. Now, um, the only thing I really know about this issue is that pop, popular opinion started to change in, a few years ago. And uh, to state anything, as a matter of fact, I, I even know the specific, we, it was a girl, we had some students from the University of Illinois here, and it was the first time that we heard something that was pro-Palestine. And I still remember seeing some given some literature at a lefty rallies and someone um, objecting to receiving it. But slowly it began. And then we had that incident, I guess it was an incident with the bulldozer girl who tragically uh, was hurt in, in, in an accident. So she became something of, a, 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 of an, a major thing. But this public sentiment, I don't know what it is perhaps it was the, I, sometimes I think it may be the influx of Middle Eastern students onto the campuses in larger numbers than previously. I, I don't know, I've not done a study of this or assessment, but the sentiments uh, are going the other way. Um, the only other thing I know about this is having seen a photo of the wall. Um, Jimmy Carter said, take down that wall, and I say, take down that wall. Whoever put it up, that was a mistake, and it remains a mistake. That's not a solution. That, that's that, that's got to come down, and it might be a good way to start the peace process, is to get those walls don't do barriers of that nature. Are, are certainly not solutions, they're not diplomacy. They're not arranging a settlement, getting two parties together. I deal with mediators all the time. We, we have Federal Mediation Conciliation Service, and mediators have forced me to arrive at a middle ground. And uh, sometimes it does take a strong man. I've had mediators say, listen, if I don't hear any movement from either side, uh, I'm going to make a decision on the party that I think is not moving and you're not going to like it, but that's the one thing you're going to have to live with. So I have to deal with mediators who say, listen, you got it. you've got until 5 o'clock to cut a deal, and that's it, pal. And sometimes they will do that. Uh, and they police us in that regard. But anyhow, uh, the only other thing I'd like to say is I found this thing at a, a lefty, lefty group. Um, it makes some accusations against Israel. Um, that I don't know if it's all objective or things like this. I believe she's something of a hero on the, or maybe who knows, but uh, I have seen her face, I believe, on, on Facebook uh, from time to time. But if anyone's got any comments, can lend some information on this. Uh, but they're claiming she's a hero and she's apparently putting up resistance uh, to the thing. Now, you dismiss it, Neil, immediately. That's not the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to tell me what, what this is all about or, or the truth behind it. Um, but anyhow, that's what I mean. This is a, something the, the lefties are, are going along with Danny right now. And I don't know if that's just the flavor of the month or whatever. But, Anyhow, thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate it. All right. He's got a question for you, Charlie. Well, question, they should keep their Asian Beatles and their Asian car. Oh. Yeah. All right. If you don't want to share them.
No. Well, it's a button. You still don't have any. You don't have any. How are you doing there, Brian? Okay. What's up? I just All right. Um, I'm just going to, real, real quick here. There are a couple of resources that I use routinely when I'm looking at Israel. And one is the Israeli Broadcast Authority. They do have an English language news broadcast with a highly good-looking anchor chick on there. She's pretty decent. But if you, it's hard to uh, come up with it, but you just look, you know, when you put Israel in the Israeli Broadcast Authority, you'll be able to find it pretty quick. I've not been able to find a live streaming uh, on the networks out of Israel yet, but I do know that Iran, if you go to PressTV.org, is the official language version for the Iranian government. And if you look around the world, if you go to those three sites, maybe CNBC, you're going to find out the same story three different ways. But if you ever really, again, just want to take a look at the, what the official mouthpiece of Israel is, it's the Israeli Broadcast Authority, and they do have the uh, nightly news from Israel. Well, as people are getting a second chance, uh, I'll take a minute. Uh, Tim, if they uh, watch the Israeli uh, propaganda channel, they have to watch Al Jazeera too. I army. have. Hmm? I have. I forgot to you mention. You do. Okay, Sorry. but you forgot to mention it just now. Right. Um, another speaker mentioned the roots of this whole thing is in, is in the Holocaust. Uh, the uh, uh, the Jews that went there, the Zionists uh, before uh, World War II, uh, they didn't really cause that much trouble. There wasn't that much upheaval, but um, because of what Hitler did. Um, with the excessive anti-Semitism, the attempt to wipe out the Jewish race, it caused this incredible backlash in which the Zionists uh, decided, well, they had to have a state of their own. One can understand that psychologically, and that's the root of the whole problem, because it did result in this, it did result in this civil war, and it's kind of a, a tragedy of history, because it's a civil war between two peoples that are very genetically similar, as has been proven by science. What we need is an understanding and an awareness of science on the part of everyone in humanity. Science is the only answer to some of these problems, and they have to be resolved based, you know, and um, um, I actually maintain that maybe we have to go uh, in, the, in the, you know, I, I had thought about this in the 1990s as, well, you know, I mean, some psychological tests or whatever, we have to find out who are those people that are not corrupt, not you know, not um, completely uh, tor you know, torn to the dark side, uh, uh, um, at, at, on the dark side of kind of, you know hating the opposition to such an extent. I don't, the suicide bombers and and the Israelis that yes they use the uh, Palestinian children as per target practice. But we have to weed them out somehow, and possibly people that can live together can live together, and by that way, and if they're not uh, destructive people among them. Um, and I don't know if they have to be weeded out by lie detector tests. At some, it could be brain fingerprinting. There's a way, actually, now that scientists can find out uh, from uh, a brain scan uh, who is psychopathic and who isn't. We just need Donald Trump to get that kind of a test. That asshole doctor that said that, or well, because he can identify a giraffe, that he was sane or you know educated as, as good as an eight-year-old. Uh, um, that that asshole has to go, and real scientists have to be involved uh, moving forward. Um, but uh, this is a test case. I mean, if you could separate the people that would be willing to reconcile and live in the same general area and not kill each other, um, you could maybe start to get a handle on the situation. It'd be hard to do. I don't know. Uh, at one time. Uh, when I went to that uh, dinner between Palestinians and Jews in 1995 or thereabouts, um, it was looking like we were, it was going to be moving towards peace. Um, I don't know what percentage of the population at that time would have been willing to go uh, towards peace. It would have been very difficult, but uh, right now it seems to be 80-20 uh, of the uh, diehards. So it, is, it makes it very difficult. You don't have to die off. Yeah. Uh, they might have to die off. This is the, this is the big problem. But science is the answer. Let's go with science logic. That's good. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention a couple sources for information that weren't mentioned. 
Uh, one of them is uh, Abby Martin, a resound, uh, world-famous journalist that's done a lot of good videos on uh, different problems around the world. Abby Martin runs a site called The Empire Files. And if you haven't never logged on and watched any of those videos, there's a bunch of good ones. And uh, she was formerly on RT America and was forced off of that with death threats because she was talking about the reality of 9-11. Uh, there's Chris, there's a book called Christians, Muslims, and Jews for 9-11 Truth. Leaders from those three religions, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, all coming together to teach that 9-11 was a false flag operation to slander Muslims and allow our country to invade Iraq and Afghanistan and the never-ending war in the Middle East. The main driving force behind global war is now the false flag event known as 9-11. So uh, incidentally on today, uh, Common Dreams, there's an article about false flag operations and why we, we have to look behind what's going on or we get sucked into these things all the time. So as many people mentioned here, there's, there's a global movement of people working for peace. And also, they've done all kinds of studies, uh, kids playing together in kindergarten, uh, Christian, Christian, Muslim, Jewish babies. If you let children grow up together without religious indoctrination, they don't fight and kill each other. It doesn't matter what their skin color is, or their ethnic background, or anything else. Kids, kids uh, get along and play just fine if they're not indoctrinated to hate by their parents or religious leaders. So we're coming to the end of the viability of the human race continuing on with this kind of artificially generated hatred by billionaires that want to make war profits. That's what it's all about. So the best sources I know of for information, again, are Common Dreams, Truth Out, uh, there's one called The Smirk of Chimp, The Empire Files has a lot of videos. And those, those three sites, incidentally, are linked to, linked, linked to hundreds of other sites with credible uh, sources of scientists that have been working uh, their whole careers publishing credible stuff. So it's, it's easy to sort out what's credible and what's not it is. if you know where to look on the internet. Call, contact me for information on any of this if anybody has any questions. And are there any more rebuttals or are we going to gavel out for the night? No, we got to get that. I just thank you. Sid's got time. Well, we got Dan at this to do the final speech. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Dan, Dan's going to get the final wrap up here. Sid's out there. Sid's talking. If we want to do away with war, the only way to go about it is to get rid of imperialism. Because with war, imperialists make super profits, and that's what they're really after. But they use religion. They use other forms of propaganda in order to rationalize these wars. Sid, quick question. And people think it's all about religion, it isn't. Is it imperialist or capitalist that you're wondering? Well, imperialist, capitalism is imperialist at a certain stage of its development. What happens is you get monopolies. And monopolies need loads of raw materials. They need markets. Because the markets in the home countries are too small to absorb all the things that are produced and, and they need other things. And one thing about imperialism, whether it's Roman, whether it's English, whether it's any other imperialism, they never stop growing. Because if they stop growing, they die. So they have to keep expanding, expanding, expanding. So you have to get rid of that. Okay. All right. All right, thanks for your rebuttals. Um, as far as Arab countries throwing out their Jews, Arab countries never had a Holocaust like the Europe had a Holocaust. And a lot of Zionists, like Begin and Shamir, went to Morocco, they went to Iraq, they went to Iran, according to Thomas Suarez, and they they, they set off bombs, they negotiated with, yeah, they negotiated with the governments to throw out the Jews. 
and to to get the Jews out to because they wanted Jews in Israel, Palestine, the new country. So actually, it was the government, the Arab governments never threw out the Jews. That's false. <laughs> Bullshit. Okay. As far right, as Neil. Zionism starting in World War II after Hitler. Zionism, Hit Herzl was 1892, the first Zionist Congress. So there were there was Zionism before. As far as a uh, long shot by Craig Hodges, I do want to read that. And Steve Salida, I've seen his talks on YouTube. He's a couple of years older than my son. But uh, actually what happened was at U of I in Champaign, the board of directors met, and there was a board of directors person who was probably a big corporate head uh, of a big corporation, and he didn't like what Salida wrote in, in his tweets. So he said, fire this guy. And Salida was going to start teaching in two weeks. So he, he was out of money for a while. So that's what happened as far as that. And I think UNRWA does help. Don't they help Burmese refugees, or they only help Palestinians? I don't think it's only set up for the Palestinians. And as far as information on the internet, I gave out a fact sheet, bibliography. There is a book called On Anti-Semitism by the Jewish Voice for Peace. There is a book called The Biggest Prison on Earth about Gaza in the West Bank by Elon Pape from 2016. And, uh, some poetry, so what, by Muhammad Ali Taha. Support the Gaza Free Trade Zone. That's all you got to do. Yeah. And as far as websites, uh, the Electronic Intifada is a good one. Jewish Voice for Peace yeah. is good. <laughs> Not in my name. Rabbis for Human Rights is a good one also. And as far as Resmia. Asmia O'Day, she was deported. She got, she went back to Jordan, somewhere she was barely from. And uh, because she supposedly lied on her passport application, and she was in prison for 10 years. So that's, she was deported, I think, last year. She got on a plane and went back by the government of America. As far as art, and in uh, peace. There was a show at, at the Evanston Art Center called Far From the Front Lines. It was Palestinian, Jewish, and Arab art. And this, this is one of the statements. The exhibition brings together a community of artists who strongly feel that art is personal, that the personal is political, and the political is very personal. The 22 North American contemporary artists selected for this exhibition were among those who responded to the call to create art about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As in many mediums, perspective derives from distance. Being far away opens up natural space for new viewpoints. Artists who are far from the front lines have created an opportunity for artful dialogue beyond borders. It, allow, it allows both the audience and the artists Ooh. themselves for act, to actively promote meaningful change in our minds where all border, borders ultimately reside. Of course, borders are arbitrary lines drawn by people. And another thing, I've been in about 13 art shows that are on that website. You can go see. Um, I'm in an art show at the um, Paul Henry's Art Gallery in Hammond. I don't see the Indiana person here. But it's in Hammond starting. May 5th, which is a week from today, I think. And uh, also, uh, the Oak Park Art League, there's going to be a show May, starting May 11th. Those are uh, four by six postcards. And I have a number of political things on the postcards. And you can, those are for uh, uh, 
a benefit for the Oak Park Art League. Also, Abby Martin, she, uh, I've seen her show on, uh, with Chris Hedges, when Chris Hedges is on it. She's very good. And she was on RT. She's not on RT anymore. Her life was threatened. She had to get off the show. Wow. So she's on what? Empire Files. Empire Files. Okay, that sounds good. That's her, her website. Okay. I'll check that out. All right. Okay, that's all. Thanks a lot, all right. Charlie. Thank you. Andy. Andy. Thank you, Andy. Andy. Okay, and thank, you, Andy. thank you all for coming. And we're adjourned. We'll see you next week. Oh, okay. Thank you. Did we get a result? Yeah, yeah. He's done now. You got to work out. You got to work out. Well, oh, tomorrow. Oh. If we went to our town. He's at 12 o'clock. He's at a quarter to nine. Uh, yeah. So I got a question for you. The Vietnam War did happen. Yeah. Why? They cut off, they cut off the money. Israel.